What makes the difference between an antique and an artifact? Well, that's a contentious question, but an antique is generally something that's old and valuable. An artifact is something that's old and not necessarily valuable, but tells a story. The very best artifacts are both culturally and financially valuable. The stories of incredible objects from the past always interest us, and we hope they interest you in this video. One of the most common ways for an archaeological discovery to be made is when a new road is being dug up or laid down. The process involves moving earth that hasn't been touched for years. And below that earth, there are ancient discoveries waiting to be found. That proved to be the case yet again in Sweden when a roadway was being expanded close to Alvangen. The artifacts found there are relics of the Iron Age, but they're not iron, they're wooden. They are, in fact, some of the oldest human-made wooden objects ever discovered in the country. Through carbon dating, archaeologists have been able to confirm they were made 1,700 years ago. Among the objects is a wooden wheel, which appears to confirm existing theories that the area was farmland during ancient times. There was once a waterway here, which would have been the only waterway connecting the sea to a network of inland lakes, which today made up Lake Vanern. That would have made it an attractive place for settlers and traders from the Stone Age onward. The damp, oxygen-deprived clay proved to be the perfect preservative for these precious finds. In 1891, a ship called the Maid of Lincoln set sail from the Abrolos Islands, just off the coast of West Australia, carrying a cargo of guano. It didn't get very far. The ship got into trouble during rough weather and was wrecked just outside Jurian Bay. The crew all escaped with their lives, but the vessel couldn't be saved. The crew made it in their lifeboat to a stretch of shoreline where they found the Grigson family traveling with their horse and cart. The family used the horse and cart to take them to safety, and the captain of the Maid of Lincoln gifted the lifeboat to them by way of thanks. After using it as a fishing boat for several years, the family stashed it in an old hay shed. That's where it stayed until it was rediscovered in the rafters in March 2021. John Grigson, a direct descendant of the 19th century Grigsons, invited archaeologist Bob Shepard to come and take a look at it on the off chance it might be valuable. Bob was stunned at the sight of this piece of local maritime history. It's now been extracted from the barn and fully restored. Hopefully, it will find a place in a museum. We've already seen Swedish road workers stumble across Iron Age treasures. Now here's another story involving construction workers making a surprise discovery, this time in Gumishan, Turkey. In November 2017, a power distribution unit in the Turkish province was in the process of being renovated when workers unearthed this ancient stone sarcophagus cover. It's 1,407 years old, which dates it to the Byzantine era. The Greek characters etched into the surface of the lid are still legible and translate into English as Blessed Candis sleeps here. It's thought that the sarcophagus itself is still beneath the ground, but the lid somehow became disturbed and separated at some point in the distant past. The discovery comes with a small mystery for the region's archaeologists because there's no record of a settlement ever existing here in ancient times. A sarcophagus this grand would normally be in a necropolis, but if this were a necropolis, then the construction workers should have found more than just one sarcophagus cover. A further archaeological search of the area was ordered immediately, but no more significant discoveries were made. That makes this stone slab quite an enigma. The discovery of the Must Farm Bronze Age settlement in England has been slow and methodical. It started in 1999 with the discovery of a few simple wooden posts alongside an old sword. Further digs were authorized at the site in Whittlesley, Cambridgeshire, resulting in the discovery of eight Bronze Age log boats in 2011. By 2012, archaeologists were sure that they were dealing with a whole previously unknown town. Here in the 2020s, it's considered such an important site that some historians describe it as Britain's Pompeii. Archaeologists have often wondered why the artifacts discovered at Must Farm seemed to have been abandoned while still brand new. They now believe that they've found an answer. Analysis of charred wood and ash at the site 
suggests that there was an enormous fire just one year after the settlement was founded, after which it was abandoned and never returned to. The evacuation was so rushed that many of the earthenware pots found in the old houses still contain food. All of this happened somewhere between 2,800 and 3,000 years ago. Must Farm is like a time capsule, one that archaeologists are still working their way through today. In 1897, British soldiers attacked and looted Benin City in the Kingdom of Benin, a part of the world that's now part of Nigeria. In the process, they stole thousands of cultural artifacts and works of art, including many fine examples of ivory and metal structures. In April 2021, one of those sculptures finally found its way back home. It's an outstanding example of a Benin bronze, a sculpture designed to resemble the head of a king. Hopefully, it will be the first of many such sculptures that find their way to the newly founded Edo Museum of West African Art in the years to come. Until now, the piece has been in the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, having been bought at an auction in 1957. The university returned the artifact voluntarily, having conducted a review of the circumstances of its acquisition and deemed them to be unethical. Another looted Benin City artwork, a sculpture of a cockerel, was returned under similar circumstances by the University of Cambridge in 2019. Lai Mohammed, Nigeria's Minister of Information and Culture, has appealed for more institutions across the world to follow the same example. It's a cliché to say that a bad carpenter blames his tools. How long has that cliché been around for? Well, probably at least 2,000 years and probably more. This beautifully well-preserved carpenter's tool was found in the ruins of Yokai Chijikata in Japan's Komatsu Prefecture in July 2017. Despite its flawless appearance, it was made at least 2,300 years ago, during the time of the Yayoi pottery culture period. To be more specific, it's a Yarigana cutting pike plane, still attached to a haft. Back when it was brand new, it would have been considered a cutting-edge piece of technology, if you'll excuse the pun. Karu Tarasawa, the head of the Makimukugaku Research Center in Sakurai, says that tools like this are the point of origin for the Japanese manufacturing industry. No self-respecting carpenter of the era would have been seen without one. It would have been used to give wooden items a smooth finish, mostly for aesthetic purposes. This exact type of tool remained in use until Diagana iron planes, which are still used today, came along in the 14th century. This appears to be a miniature version of the tool. Normally, a Yarigana was a two-handed instrument, but this artifact was designed to be used with just one hand. For the past five years, a team of students from the French school in Athens, Greece, have been carrying out archaeological excavations at the Anavlochos Massif in Crete. They found a wide variety of objects and artifacts in that time, but perhaps none as ornate and interesting as these tiny votive offerings. The majority of the little sculptures represent female figures and come from the classical and archaic periods. The figures that aren't of women tend to be zoomorphic and are scattered around several groups of grave and burial sites. The strange thing with these discoveries is that the entire area had already been surveyed by Pierre de Marne in 1929, who also found votive figurines and believed that he'd already discovered everything the area had to offer by the time he finished digging. Either he didn't dig down deep enough or these students were a lot keener to get to the bottom of the matter than he was. Votive offerings were often left behind by people either as a way of giving a blessing or in the hope of receiving one. While they're often seen as grave goods, they're also sometimes found in the foundations of temples and other religiously significant buildings. The question of why all the figurines in this part of Crete are female is unresolved. There are so many myths and legends that surround Charlemagne, also known as Charles the Great, that it's hard to know what's real and what isn't. We know that he was a genuine historical figure who achieved a great deal during his life. He became King of the Franks in 768, King of the Lombards in 774, and then the Emperor of the Romans in the year 800. This beautiful piece of jewelry, 
a Carolinian reliquary medallion, is known as the Talisman of Charlemagne and is said to have belonged to the great leader. But the connection between the man and the artifact cannot be proven, nor can the truth of the object it's said to contain. Beneath the central gemstone of the priceless 9th century artifact are a few clearly visible shards of wood. It's said that these shards come from the true cross, the crucifix upon which Jesus Christ died. It's also said to have once contained a strand of hair from the Virgin Mary, although this was apparently lost when two sapphires were replaced with enamel glass in 1804 for unknown reasons. It's said to have been found around the neck of Charlemagne when his tomb was opened by Friedrich Barbarossa in 1166, but the first mention of this doesn't appear until 1620. What's the real story of this artifact? We'll probably never know. Most archaeologists dream of finding something that will change our notions about human history, but very few of them ever do. These tools and crystals might just force a few scientists back to the drawing board, though. They were found in a rock shelter in the Kalahari Desert in early 2021, and already have a lot of experts scratching their heads. That's mostly because of their age. Almost impossibly, these tools are thought to have been made 105,000 years ago. We know that tools of around the same standard were being created elsewhere on the African coast at the same time, but nothing with this degree of sophistication from the same era has ever been found in South Africa before. It challenges our idea that human life as we understand it came from one specific point in Africa and spread out across the world. It now seems that humans in many different places across Africa might have reached the same evolutionary level at the same time. The tools found here were accompanied by bones that showed signs of butchery and ostrich shells that may have been used as water vessels. The 22 white calcite crystals aren't native to the cave, and so much have been brought here, but experts have no idea why. This entire cave on Gamohana Hill is now an archaeological hotspot as experts go in search of more information. You'll find the peacock clock in the State Hermitage Museum of St. Petersburg, Russia, although you might initially struggle to identify it as a clock. It's more like a series of golden sculptures, including a tree and several birds. But all the seemingly individual sculptures are part of one cohesive automaton. Making something like this would be a remarkable feat of engineering today, never mind 200 years ago when it was actually built. The clock, built by Englishman James Cox in 1777 and sold to Prince Grigory Potemkin in 1797, is still functional today. The rooster, peacock, and owl still move and even still sing with their mechanical voices. This is the only example of unrepaired, unrefurbished, large-scale 18th century robotics that's still functional anywhere in the world today. You have to look very hard to find the clock face. It's hidden in a small mushroom next to a fox among the metal foliage. Cox apparently intended the whole piece to be a representation of the continuity of life. We're not sure about that, but we're happy to recognize that it's a gorgeous work of art. We've already talked about what a fascinating historical figure Charlemagne was. So, let's return to the legends that surround him by checking out this next artifact. It's known as the Joyeuse, and it was allegedly his personal sword. Nobody can prove the historical providence of the weapon, but the Louvre thinks enough of it to have it on permanent public display. If this is truly Charlemagne's sword, it has quite the story behind it. Like Excalibur, the sword of the mythical King Arthur of England, Joyeuse is said to have supernatural qualities. Legends say it reflected the sun so brightly during battles that it blinded the king's enemies. It also allegedly somehow has the power to protect anyone who holds it against the effects of poison. It even lends its name to a town in the Ardec region, which is where the weapon is said to have been lost and subsequently rediscovered again after a great battle. There's no record of the location of Joyeuse at the time of Charlemagne's death, but the weapon is said to have been used at the coronation of King Philip III of France in 1270. 
The sword held by the Louvre is unquestionably the same one that was used in Philip III's coronation. The only question is whether it's also the same one that was once wielded by Charlemagne, and we'll probably never be able to prove that. To some people, the Casco del Liro is a beautiful Bronze Age helmet, perhaps one worn by an ancient ruler in northwest Iberia. To others, it's a charming and elaborately decorated bowl of the kind that you might use to store fruit in. It's all a matter of perspective and belief. The artifact was discovered accidentally by a fisherman in Galicia, Spain in 1976. He wasn't out on the water at the time. He was clearing a strip of land on Liro Beach so he'd have room to build a new shed. The beautiful golden object was hiding among the debris and may have been on the beach for as long as 1,200 years. Amazingly, the entire object was created by hammering out just one single piece of gold and then decorating it with six thin bands of concentric circles. It seems far too elaborate to be a bowl, and yet it doesn't fit the style of any known crown or helmet. It's an utterly unique artifact and is now conserved and protected at the Museo Archeológico e Histórico of a Coruña. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you soon.